nest for the Windsor Essex County Health Unit. Uh, Lana. Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm Alana Odway, and I am also um, a WeLit project assistant along with Monica um, and working alongside Michelle. Um, I've been here for just over a month, so this is, I think, my first meeting um, on this specific project, but um, I'm looking forward to um, working with all of you. Thank you. Thanks. Francie. Hello, everybody. I'm working at the Windsor Essex Bilingual Legal Clinic. I'm the leader of the Care for International Workers Program and the Spanish Speaking Population Program. Thank you. With Stephanie. Hello, Stephanie Sigib Tisan. I'm a new member. I reached out. Um, I do work at Victorian Order of Nurses as a regional manager in the student nutrition program. However, I'm joining as a community member as we have a mid sized family owned greenhouse operation and we've been involved in some of the migrant uh, worker issues and really want to add uh, my voice if it's helpful. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Sarah May. Hi everybody, Sarah May Garcia. I work at the Ear St. Clair Lynn uh, with Laura Strafty and I am a lead for strategy and uh, priority populations. I am also co-chairing this group with Kim. And Margo. Hello everyone, I'm Margo Riley. I'm the executive director at the Harrow Health Center. Thank you, Justine. Justine Taylor, I'm the Science and Government Relations Manager for the Ontario Greenhouse Vegetable Growers. Thank you. Uh, Allison? Hi, I'm Allison Chandler. I'm the Workplace Outreach Worker at Canadian Mental Health. Uh, I apologize, I don't have my camera on today to, uh, to meet you guys. I'm borrowing an office and uh, I'm not sure that that person would want their office on display um, on Zoom and I don't know how to do those fancy backgrounds, so I don't have my camera on, but nice to meet you. Thanks, Allison. And Liz. Hey, sorry, I don't have my camera on either. Um, I'm Liz McCall, I'm the, the care and service manager uh, for Vi Victorian Order of Nurses. I'm over the Immigrant Health Clinic, the Francophone Clinic, and involved in some of the other projects that are going on. Um, I apologize that Paula Van Thurnout, uh, the senior manager, couldn't attend today, so I am in attending in her place today. Um, but we are involved in a lot of the projects that are going on in different groups. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, before we get into the, the meat and potatoes, um, does anyone have anything to add to the agenda? Okay, hearing none, uh, we'll approve that. And then looking at the notes from October 26th, um, I'm just going to look at some of the action pieces um, under Hub Connect. Uh, Gordon to connect with Justine regarding the COVID-19 button on the app to allow for updates. Did that happen, Justine? Yep. Yeah, we've had a whole kind of like sub, sub, sub working group meeting. I'm not sure what level <laughs> okay. it was actually. Okay. We pulled together a bunch of people who uh, have interest in the app and kind of connected them and set a plan for moving forward. Okay. And did that ties into the sharing of the promo materials? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, sheltering and isolation, the farm survey. Uh, Laura to send survey to Monica to share with the task force. That happened? Yep. Yep. Okay. Good, good. Uh, and then um, the next piece uh, is around, as far as action items, was the flu shot clinic. Laura to connect with Tim Brady to coordinate available pharmacists willing to conduct on-site flu clinics. Um, that follow-up happened. Um, I didn't hear back from Tim. Um, okay. Didn't get any uptake with farms and interest. So it's kind of a moot point. Right. And Beth was going to find out the name of a grower open to hosting a clinic and sharing it with Laura. Did that happen? No. No, I didn't hear from Beth. Okay. Um, the primary care, 
Um, Margot had said she's open to sharing news such as Hub Connect, their social media that the task force can amplify. So I did it. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Francie shared that she's available for translation services. Um, uh, uh, that's it for the action items. Did anyone have any other comments or concerns about meeting the notes before we get into the agenda for today? Okay. Then hearing nothing, we'll move on to number three, uh, the Occupational Health Clinics for Ontario Workers Migrant Worker Initiative. I will turn it over to you, Eduardo. Great, thank you so much. I'm just gonna share my screen. I have a little bit of a PowerPoint. Um, and sorry, I, this is a bit of a repeat for a couple of folks that um, were part of the Hub Connect meeting with Justine that I presented uh, this as well. So hopefully it's not too repetitive, but um, one second, let me just get my PowerPoint organized. Um, oops, let's see, this one's a little tricky. Um, Perfect. Great. So can you see my um, my slideshow right now? Yep. Okay, great. Sorry about that. It's always a little bit of a delay. Okay, great. So um, I was just going to start a little bit about who we are. Um, so a lot of people kind of don't tend to, to know us, but uh, um, we are the Occupational Health Clinics for Ontario Workers. So we're a network of occupational health clinics funded not through health, but through the Ministry of Labor's prevention stream. Uh, so we're really a free resource to um, workplaces, Ontario workplaces, workers and employers, uh, really focused on providing occupational health support. Um, so both clinical support as well as informational support. Um, so we have seven clinics spread out throughout the province now. Um, so we actually have a Windsor clinic um, and uh, they had been, we had a nurse there actually who was quite active in working around farming um, related uh, support, uh, but she has since retired. Um, but uh, yeah, so our, our clinic really, our staff is half clinical folks, so doctors and nurses, and, and then also the rest of the, the staff are occupational health experts, um, people like occupational hi um, health hygienists, um, ergonomists, um, so different, you know, disciplines that focus on understanding work and how work uh, affects health. Um, specifically, where I kind of come in, I'm the program coordinator of a program we started in 2006. So it's been running for quite some time. Um, and this is our migrant farm worker program. Uh, so I, early on in 2006, kind of joined OCOW and we, we constructed this, this program um, or kind of organized this program and, and have been running it since. And it's kind of changed throughout the years, um, but uh, it's been very, on the ground with workers. So that's kind of something that we often stress is that uh, we end up, so this is a, a bit of a dated map, but um, in the below right corner, kind of the, the, of the hot spots, the agriculture hot spots of where workers are arriving to. So on a regular season, and obviously kind of pre COVID times, I would be you know, driving around the province, uh, going to most of these regions and, and connecting to, to worker communities um, in person. So these are just some pictures of, uh, of some of our program activities. Um, this, this is a bit of a breakdown of what our program really focuses on. Um, so I'm not going to talk so much on all of this. I, I was going to focus a bit more on communication with workers and some of our experience on effective ways to uh, pass information and, uh, and education communication strategies with workers. But uh, this kind of gives a bit of a broader idea of our program. Um, so originally, really, we started with these Auk Health parachute clinics, again, really early on, around 2006, 2007. So what this looked like, and a lot of the CHCs, um, now it kind of looks a lot like the CHC clinics, but early on, what we were doing is we would connect with community groups, and we would just basically land in the community with our physician and nurses and provide a free access uh, clinic uh, for workers with translation available. So sometimes that looked like, you know, in church, in churches, in community settings, uh, sorry, community um, uh, events, things like that. It was always very strictly, obviously, abiding by privacy and care uh, standards. Um, but uh, but we were really mobile, very uh, very flexible in terms of the location to really make sure that workers could could reach our clinic. 
Um, these clinics were definitely not meant to provide any type of ongoing care and it really wasn't focused on primary care. Again, they were advertised to workers as, you know, if you have a concern that you think is related to your work, come see us. Um, and really what the clinics were mostly focused on were obviously providing that, that initial access to workers with a physician. So our physician could you know, prescribe or, or triage folks to local services. Um, but it was mostly for us to learn about what were the main occupational health issues affecting these workers. Um, so it was really the start of our program to really understand what was the needs of the community and what was going on with them to then kind of start forming the rest of our responses and supports. So we ran these clinics uh, throughout the province um, and now we're not actually running these clinics uh, anymore because of the increased participation of CHCs. So now we, we have a uh, couple, um, we have some relationships with some of the main CHCs in some regions. So we're now providing more OC Health support to, to the primary uh, health care services that, that they are now um, uh, focus on. So the other aspects of, of our program is based on what we've learned in terms of the main occupational health issues, we then um, focused on providing uh, occupational health and safety education and information to workers to try to prevent the, the issues that we're seeing clinically. And so I, as I'm gonna get to this type of information and outreach and education happen both in the community um, at health fairs, which we, we uh, also were in Leamington and, and in, in the region as well, um, as well as by invitation to, on the farm, sorry, by the invitation of employers. So our workshops were, were provided on the farms as well. We also have specialized pro, uh, projects. So anytime we see a particular issue that seems to kind of continuously rise to the top in terms of workers concerns or employer concerns as well, we sometimes then focus in on, on those. So one example is pesticides. We've, we've um, focused in quite a bit of attention around pesticide safety and pesticide information for workers as that tends to be an area of concern for them. Um, we do a bit of research as well. So we, we often uh, collaborate with some researchers in, in this area. Um, and then we put on a yearly forum. Um, and actually in 2019, it was in, in Windsor at the University of Windsor. Um, and Justine and, and, um, and Francie actually spoke at, uh, at the event as well. Um, so that kind of just gives a bit of a, of a overview. Um, this slide just, again, reiterates a bit of the experience with the parachute clinics that we were running. So this is a bit of a, a dated, uh, again, we, we stopped running these clinics, um, but this kind of shows, at least in the, in the midst of, of kind of seeing the most workers we, we did, um, these were the main occupational health issues that we saw among workers. So, you know, there's, it's very similar when we see the CHCs present on, on the issues that they continuously see, it's very reflective of, of the same issues. So we see a lot of MSK issues or musculoskeletal issues. Makes sense in terms of the work, a lot of muscle strains, muscle pulls um, uh, and things like that. Dermal issues as well, skin irritation. Uh, we were seeing a lot of skin irritation, both in relation to crops or, or you know, um, reaction to plants and, and, and crops, as well as, as uh, concerns around any kind of um, agricultural inputs, uh, both soaps can be, you know, pesticide residues and, and things like that. We would, we saw a lot of eye issues, eye irritation, eye, um, a uh, one uh, very specific condition called pterygium that we see a lot, a lot among uh, both uh, Latino workers as well as Caribbean workers, which is a little flap of skin that starts growing from the side to the center of the eye. We'd see a lot of that and then um, so on. And so these are just a couple pictures of our, our parachute clinics as well. Um, and just jumping into, I guess, more of the focus around communication with workers and information. Um, again, really early on, we did see a, a large gap in terms of not really finding a lot of occupational health and safety information in formats that were accessible to workers. Um, so we continue to struggle that, uh, with that actually a little bit. Um, uh, you know, I think things have changed a lot and there's a lot more um, involvement from different groups who, who really are looking at accessibility. Uh, but even now, um, in the early days of the pandemic, we still were, um, you know, finding difficulty in terms of our initial, you know, jumping into this and trying to figure out where to support. We found a lot of gaps in, in, in safety material that, were, that was accessible to workers. So we saw a lot of material being more directed, obviously, to employers, which makes sense um, in terms of, of employers organizing the safety you know, programs and policies um, at the workplace. But oftentimes, that type of information wasn't really 
translated into work or accessible formats. Um, sometimes even that the text wasn't translated and or sometimes it was translated, but it stayed very text heavy um, and, and bulky and not that accessible to workers. So our program had really focused on looking for resources uh, that were accessible, um, as well as a bit of experience developing our own resources with, with this a bit of accessibility lens. Um, it took us a lot to look at the US. So a lot of our resources end up being from the US just because of you know, the, the really extensive experience that, that um, groups have there with, with uh, migrant farm workers or, or um, um, yeah, migrant farm worker communities. Um, and then there's just been a lot of focus put in into understanding the learning needs um, and, and just strategy communica uh, communication strategy with workers. So these are a couple of formats that we end up, end up highlighting that we found are useful uh, for um, communicating information to workers. And so I was just gonna really briefly um, touch on a couple or, or on these um, in case that's, that's useful as well. So we tend to really work a lot with image heavy or um, tech or comic uh, based formats. So we found comics tend to be very uh, well documented in terms of their use with this population. Um, recently, I actually have been uh, focused on trying to find COVID-19 resources in Thai because we found that um, within resource gaps, Thai language resource gaps are even more um, more apparent than, than Spanish. Um, but, uh, and, and recently I connected to the WHO office in Thailand, just in terms of, of trying to really look for Thai resources. And they connected me to this uh, Thai comic book, which is interesting because it really reflects uh, the use of comics also within, within the Latino community. Um, so these are just some images of, of uh, resources we've used in the past. Uh, again, just really image-based, uh, comic book-based. And, and if it's an interest, I can share this presentation um, after the meeting and then these links are you know in the pdf form actually you know you, you can explore them and, and see the examples of, of these resources um another one are uh, another kind of format that's that's well documented in terms of use with communities is the photo novella so it's slightly different than the comic book um and it's really it has a lot of history within uh the use with uh latino farm worker communities in the us uh, so this is a link to a website of a group that really has you know, push this format forward in the US. Um, and they really describe uh, this type of format and, and how it can be effective with this group. Um, it's slightly different. It looks a lot like the comic book format, but it, it tends to be more of a, um, it, it has some differences in terms of there's always kind of a bit of, of a conflict. Um, it, it really hinges on, on, um, on having to kind of solve something. And it, it kind of has, uh, themes that are recurrent in, in this type of, of format that, that uh, are interested. So we've used this, uh, this format in, in um, eye health and safety uh, focus. So there, this actually group in the US uh, developed a series of photo novellas looking at eye health and safety. Um, so again, this is, seems, to be, seems to be an interesting uh, format uh, for this group as well. Uh, pictograms. So these are examples of a couple pictograms or set of, of pictograms that were actually uh, developed by the government of Ontario. Um, and the tricky thing is that they actually weren't developed for farming. They were developed for construction and, and uh, a couple of other sectors. But we, at the beginning of the, of the pandemic, we looked at them and said, you know, this is actually very useful. Um, and we hadn't really seen resources in, in pictograms before for farm workers. So we had you know collected them and and the ones that we found relevant for farming we did a bit of of pretty um not great editing to some of the images so this one that's looking at tools that were obviously more construction we have a version that we put you know shovels and some some tools more appropriate for farming to try to uh really quickly adapt them um, and distribute them to employers in the sector um so right now we're actually in the process of working with the ministry of labor of ontario to actually package them uh, the set of pictograms specifically for farming and have them translated into Spanish and Thai um, and and uh, and yeah tweak some of the pictograms again to make them more accessible. Um, the thing that we really find with pictograms though is that it's it's a fine line because uh, you know images are very important but as I'm going to get to um, in a couple of slides it it, pictograms could also be misinterpreted by workers and that's something that we find so it's it's very important to also consider 
you know, the text accompanying pictograms, at least some text potentially, or some sort of guidance around how to present pictograms so that, um, you know, or, or piloting pictograms becomes very important so that you, you ensure that in, in the attempts to reduce a lot of text and just rely on a couple of images, you don't end up also, um, uh, you know, putting all kind of the eggs in, in, a, in the basket of a couple images and, and risking um, not having it be clear to workers. Um, videos. So whenever we've we've talked to workers around the the most effective uh, routes of communication that they would like or that they find useful, videos are all always at the top of the list. Um, so we've seen examples of more groups uh, putting together uh, videos for for this uh, worker community. So here's a couple of examples. Uh, PMRA Health Canada early on. Uh, produced a set of videos in these kind of animation uh, formats uh, for pesticide safety for farm workers, as well as the OPEP, Ontario Pesticide Education Program, also has done videos and actually has included uh, workers as actual actors uh, within their videos uh, before. And there's other examples as well. Um, WSPS, which is uh, used to be the Farm Safety Association for Farming in Ontario, um, uh, they, they also have a set of videos as well. So um, definitely a, a really useful um, format uh, for this group as well. Again, based um, on literacy uh, and uh, uh, challenges that some workers experience. Um, just a bit of our experience too. In 2016, we put together a toolbox. So this is what it really looked like. It was a bin, a blue bin, very, very simple, um, where we put all of our handouts. Um, and we had an English version and a Spanish version. We put all our handouts um, organized by by topic and then we produced a, a user guide for the employer uh, to kind of talk to them or, or guide them around how to use some of these resources um, for worker education on the farm and we piloted this with the Holland Marsh Growers Association so the Holland Marsh north of, of uh, Toronto um, and we provided them about 12 re, uh, resource toolboxes and they were quite popular with the growers there um, and we got feedback that they were useful and we actually had growers um, fill out a, a bit of a feedback survey. And uh, during pre-COVID times, they talked to us about thinking about maybe a, a duo tank kind of a, a folder that workers could flip through and then sign off that they had read them. But obviously now it gets trickier in terms of, you know, obviously resources passed around to workers would not be ideal. But, um, but this is just kind of an example of how we've tried to really, um, you know, pilot different ways of, of sharing our resources. Um, just really quickly, again, around the, the need to pilot resources, we did an activity uh, where we piloted this poster, or sorry, we, we tried to get a really good sense of, of what workers understood um, in terms of this poster that was produced quite, quite a few years ago by PMRA Health Canada, again, about pesticide safety. So the poster was divided into these kind of safety message squares. Um, and what we did was at community health fairs in different regions, we put up the poster and we had a wheel and we numbered the squares. We had workers spin the wheel and whatever square they landed on, we asked them what they interpreted in terms of what that square was trying to tell them. And, um, and really what we found was that these posters were not very effective without some sort of presentation of the poster. So as a standalone, if the poster was just put up and it was not explained to workers, there was a lot of misinterpretation. So up here, there's an example where in this square that talks about no entry interval. So, you know, when spraying occurs, you have to stay out of the field for uh, you know, a period of time. Workers interpreted that square as talking about road safety or safety about crossing the road, which makes sense in terms of you know, this kind of stop looks kind of like a stop sign. So again, in terms of the main finding, it was that for a lot of posters, you really need, if they're gonna be put up at the workplace, you really need some sort of orientation of the poster so that then the poster becomes a useful tool of a reminder of messages that have already been um, articulated or, or communicated with workers. Um, again, we've we've then used posters. Uh, we in 2019 we we got some funding to uh, develop our own pesticide safety posters. So we distributed these to farmers during um, in February, right before the pandemic actually. Uh, hit here. Um, so we got a chance to, to distribute these posters uh, to farmers at this big uh, convention that happens every year, um, the Ontario Fruit and Vegetable Convention. Um, so again, another example of us trying to just get a lot of resources out. Um, and so at the beginning of COVID, again, through the struggle of finding resources, we really focused in on producing these PDFs of as many worker accessible uh, COVID safety resources that we could find. 
Um, so one of the PDFs focused on resources that were Ontario produced. Um, and the other one was a more extensive list of resources that we found from CDC, from the government of Mexico. Um, and so was really tried to find more, more resources. Uh, and so we early on, and this was produced in May, and we circulated, uh, circulated this uh, to employers just to basically be a set of resources that, that uh, they could uh, use. And then we've also seen that a lot of other groups have done similar um, PDFs with just lists of resources. So currently I'm, I'm actually working with Justine on a project where we're, we're updating, we're taking kind of all of the lists that different agencies and groups uh, had put together for COVID and we're trying to kind of come up with the updated resource list uh, in preparation ongoing throughout the season, but also in preparation for the heavy season of, of next next year as well. And and again, I'm really looking for Thai resource uh, resources as well as we found uh, that there's not a lot. Um, we also dove into to videos. Uh, so we um, halfway, I think, through the summer, actually more Unfortunately, we were really delayed. We're, we don't have a lot of experience uh, with videos. So it was really an in-house attempt to kind of whip these videos together really quickly. And they didn't turn out too, too amazingly. And, and I kind of joke around that nowadays, you know, skill set of putting videos, people can do them so easily and we kind of struggled. So they don't look great. And, and in, some, in some of the videos, the audio uh, quality is not great, but it was really our attempt to get some information out. Um, so I'll, I can share these as well. Again, they're not perfect, uh, but we think that the, the subject matter that we included uh, was, was information that we weren't seeing articulated to workers at certain levels of degree. So, um, and uh, I, you know, there, I, I can share these um, uh, with the group as well um, in the future, uh, or sorry, after the, the, the presentation, but we focused on talking about COVID as, as, a, as a hazard and a bit of that in terms of health and safety of um, precautions at the workplace, try to include some information. And, and again, the issue with this is it's, over, it's always changing, right, in terms of healthcare access, mental health support. Um, and then we also provided um, workers with understandings around um, workplace rights and responsibilities of, of supervisors, employers, and workers at, at the workplace as well. Um, and then the last, that, uh, last piece of this too is that we have a lot of experience communicating to workers directly in person. So again, during the season, um, this past season, that hasn't been the case because of COVID, but on a regular season, we were you know, providing both in the community and in, in the workplace. So obviously the strength of in-person presentations is that workers have the, the opportunity to ask questions and we have the opportunity to kind of hear from them about what they think about the information that you're trying to relate to them. And that's really integral, really important for, for health and safety specifically um, and two-way communication so that the information you, it doesn't stop with just information you're passing the worker, but you're hearing you know, from them, whether that's relevant, whether that reflects their experience on their particular farm and things like that. So in exploring you know, present day strategies, things like webinars or live webinars or live video that has that ability Again, it's hard to necessarily picture, um, but with workers would provide some of that um, ability as well. Um, and then I think this is actually my last slide. Uh, so this was just meant to kind of provide some, some thinking around internet-based or phone-based uh, education that's, that's really been great. Uh, example, um, you know, the, the Hub Connect, Connect app, um, which is definitely going in the right direction and, and such a good uh, tool now. Um, what we do find is that there's there hasn't been a lot of assessment like standardized or or uh, very extensive assessments around workers use of of the internet uh, use of uh, smartphones so it's just on ongoingly important to really continue um, expanding our understanding of that in our in our experience workers a lot more workers are using smartphones than when we started uh, our clinics actually in, in our in our program um, however what we find is that a lot of them are using smartphones more for social media as well as for communication so i think a lot of them are getting into the accessing websites and, and navigating information but that tends to be a bit it's not as clear how many actually um have that level of of uh of internet literacy or internet navigation skills. So I think that kind of needs to be unpacked and, and some of these strategies should come with the support to, to kind of almost guide workers in, in that skill set or, or in that. Um, but I definitely, we definitely think it's, it's all going in the right direction. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so that's, that's, I, I, I'll, I'll leave it there. And, and, um, and if, yeah, if there's any thoughts and or questions and any of that, 
you know, it's, it's great to hear from other folks that have a lot of experience as well. I have a question, Eduardo. Yes. <laughs> um, just I want to know if uh, some of the resources that you already mentioned, the list and the videos, can be just put the link into the Hub Connect application in the both languages, maybe in Spanish or English. So are you still work? I know you, you work with uh, Justina with that. So are you still working in the, the links, putting the links into the hubs connect? I think so. I think at the last meeting with Justine, we, um, with the hub connect, we talked about kind of like bringing all that together. The videos were new. So we, so not, a, so we had kind of just started launching them, but yeah, anything that would be useful would be great. And I think we used to sit on the hub connect, uh, um, occupational health subcommittee. So, um, yeah, I think that would be, that'd be great. And our own website, we've struggled to kind of get a lot of these in ex up on our website. Our website's not great. We're, we're trying to, uh, organize it. So, but yeah. Oh. Okay, and another question, if it's possible to post uh, your Spanish, for example, the safety Spanish uh, PDF, can I post it in Care for International Workers as uh, information? Yes, yeah, definitely. Yeah, after I can kind of make this presentation a PDF and then also we have the videos, we have a PDF of the video links um, and okay. I, they're here, but I have another PDF that has each, each video is about three minutes. We, we made a lot of splices. So there's sub videos within that and in the PDF, it's easy, easily clickable links, both in Spanish and in English. So I can send that to, um, for, uh, for you all. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. And I Oops. think, yeah, Monica already. Has it. Yeah. Thanks. Yes. Yeah, so if you send everything to me, then I will share the information group wide. Great. Does anyone else have any questions? Okay, thanks for the presentation. That was really interesting. Lots of good information. Um, Roundtable updates, Hub Connect, uh, Karen. Yes, so as it's been spoken about a few times, um, we did have a, a little bit of a, a subcommittee meeting for the Hub Connect app. Um, and actually, uh, as a result of that, this afternoon after this meeting, myself, Gordon, who works at the health unit as well, and Nathan, who's from OGVG, we are going to be meeting and taking kind of all of the ideas and different resources that came out of that meeting and kind of discuss our action plan for implementing them into the app and then moving that forward. So we're meeting right after this. It was pretty good timing for all of us and uh, I'll have more after that meeting for sure. Okay, sounds good. Uh, community conversation review, Monica. I forgot that I had even had myself on there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so thanks to everyone who came to the community conversation, who spoke at the community conversation, it went really, really well. We had um, 135 unique participants at any given time from approximately 70 different organizations join us. And most of the people who did join us stayed for the whole two and a half hours, which I think went by really quickly. Um, uh, we have a success story posted on the WeLib website on it, and you can download that too if you want, if anyone is asking you about it and you want to share a little information. I'll put the link in the chat. And are working on a um, temporary foreign worker webpage to add to our website so that it will be an easy resource for people to refer to, to know of what, about what is going on in the community and that will be a part of it. Um, we had good feedback um, that from the survey with a lot of good ideas for next steps and where we should go next. So you'll hear from us down the road as we formulate that into a narrative. Um, yeah, so thanks again to everyone who did it. It was, it was really good and we were really happy and we just a lot of positive feedback from it. Am I forgetting anything, Michelle? Nope. Alana? No. Nope. Okay. 
Um, sheltering and isolation, Laura. Sure. <clears throat> Um, not a lot of updates since we spoke uh, five weeks ago. Uh, the IRC, um, the Isolation and Recovery Center, is still open and active. Um, at one point there were 120 in. Right now it's more like 30, maybe 25. Um, it's showing that uh, some of the farms that are getting the one and two positive cases are able to isolate at home um, on the farm. Others aren't. Um, in terms of the actual survey, I just pulled up Dan's message and we've gotten 22 results in total. Um, so I think that's out of like 180 some odd. So not a huge response, um, but uh, just listening to the amount of stuff going out to farms and questions and surveys and organizations, I'm sure they are burnt out from email surveys too. So um, that committee, the Sheltering and Isolation Survey Committee is starting to shift focus, not well shift focus, but um, looking towards quarantine on return. Um, so lots of workers are heading home um, for holidays or their break or how the timing works. Um, and we throw these terms around every day, but not everybody understands the difference between a quarantine and isolation and all of that piece. So, um, you know, we'll, I imagine we will do our best in the new year and see how it goes. Um, the government can support the isolation, which is after a health unit positive case, um, without the ability to um, isolate that worker for 14 days. Quarantine is you've entered the country and you have to wait for 14 days. You could be healthy, you could be ready to go, um, but you have to do that. The government, our government is not, Ontario government is not funding that. Um, BC, I believe is, is it BC, Justine? Yeah. Um, we haven't gotten to that space yet, so I imagine the terms become interchanged um, moving forward. I did have a call with Omafra, Sir May and I did the other day, and there was a lot of chatter on that about how to use that 14-day quarantine um, this year uh, for the most amount of worker education, um, empowering them, giving them materials, training, you know, anything uh, to beef up their COVID knowledge and safety protocols before they go on farm. Um, I don't know how that works when people don't really have eyes on them other than the farm knowing they're coming, but um, this meeting is a good reminder that um, I'll go back to that table talking about the Hub Connect and um, any resources that uh, come out. Uh, I think that is all I've got for sheltering and isolation. Any questions? Okay. You were super clear, Laura. <laughs> That's why we don't have questions. Thanks, Laura. Um, <clears throat> primary care capacity discussion, Sarah May. We are so efficient on this meeting. <laughs> we're just chugging right along, eh? Um, and I'll probably call on Laura and some others too to help with this piece because I know there have been ongoing conversations um, and for the benefit of people that are joining now that weren't on the initial conversations about this, uh, basically we've talked about uh, <laughs> resurrecting the work that we did pre-COVID, which was the migrant worker health focus and making sure that um, workers have access to primary care as OHIP holders. Um, but knowing that we have to take an equity lens because there's going to be some, some gaps and some disparities in terms of the hours that uh, healthcare is available, um, transportation needs, and, you know, what to do when a worker is in hospital and where do they get discharged to? Do they just get discharged back to the farm and we only see them for episodic care? Or is there a way to link them with kind of continuous primary care going forward? Um, for prevention or just to monitor their, their health as we go. So this has been an intent and as Eduardo mentioned, we were just, you know, as recently as last year at the, at the forum in Windsor talking about how might we 
connect with the available resources, do a service inventory, and connect what we've already got, and then we can show what we still need. So COVID kind of gave us a, a big shove toward doing that um, in short order, and I feel like with all the different ministries and sectors coming together in so many ways, it's a great opportunity to work together, but it's also a great opportunity to get really confused um, and maybe a little disgruntled because I feel that, you know, with the COVID response, we did the best we could. We were all making it up as we go, um, but it wasn't always a good experience for the grower, I would say, or for the workers. And so this is kind of a, a chance for us to pause and say, okay, where are we at? So all that being said, Laura and I took a bit of a, a key informant interview type of a style to it, where we sat down with each of the primary care providers that had said, sure, we may have some capacity. Um, and I'm not sure, like I've got Margo here. Hey, Margo. Um, don't know if we have anybody from Rita's group from the CHC or other FHT. We've got Liz, Nicole. So, that's, so we did talk to each of the primary care provider organizations with, what do you currently have available? Um, even if it's like one thing. If you've got, say, like, you know, one physician or one nurse practitioner that could go out on a Monday, um, or if you've got a spot to roster 10 workers, like we're just, and Laura's been doing all the numbers behind the scenes to see what do we currently have and how do we, how do we increase it? So one of the ways that we were working really hard to increase it was through the We Speak interpretation project, um, which I don't think we've carved out time to talk about that, but it, it definitely relates here, is... Um, so for those less familiar, we speak is the interpretation modality. So whether it be live in person, video or in person um, interpretation that providers have access to these services at a low cost. The great news is we did get a budget for primary care to access this. And so that suddenly increases the capacity where now, um, you know, migrant workers can be served in their language. So that's true capacity. Um, so that that really helped. Um, the other thing that we were looking at was some creative solutions, which we're still doing. Um, so, you know, for those that have a nurse practitioner or a physician um, that is willing to go out, you know, every second Thursday or, you know, whatever the solution is, um, daytime hours are possible. Many of the growers are um, willing to carve out the time for the workers to do it. Um, and so between what primary care is identifying as capacity and what the growers, like the key growers that we've been working with over the summer are saying, yep, we can create a clinic space or, you know, we can have a mobile unit come out, whatever that needs to look like. And then Laura's been doing some work to match those. So I don't know, Laura, if you'd want to jump in with some specifics on numbers and uh, what the growers have indicated to us. And I think that maybe if we can talk really quickly about the survey that we had planned to co-design. Um, <clears throat> so I haven't done a large scale farm reach out yet because we, I'm cognizant of creating lots of hype and interest and not being able to deliver it. So I don't have docs and primary care uh, nurse practitioners lining up to go out on farms on a set schedule. Our region is under-resourced and underserved already, so most physicians have are fully rostered. Um, almost everybody has stepped up saying, yeah, I would take five, I would take 15, I'd take 10. We would make space, but to say, yeah, every Monday I can go out and do a mobile unit with Laura, um, that's a big ask. So um, I know Rita's group is looking to hire. Um, we've got, we have full, um, well, in my opinion, we've got full abilities for all discharged um, workers from Erie Shores or from uh, Windsor Regional. There would be spaces for them to go if they are interested. Um, the care coordinators are all connected and have the plans. So that's taken care of. Um, so yeah, if anybody's just got like a cousin who is a nurse practitioner who wants to work five days a week, I could have her out on a farm. Like I, the sense from the farms has been, um, yep, if you'll come during the day and I just got to give you space. Okay. Um, we'll work around that. So that's uh, incredible, but now I 
can't staff it per se. So I haven't, I've only reached out to four farms. They've all said yes, they're varying sizes, um, but I can't reach out to more of them and then sit on it for six months and not deliver because, um, you know, then we look like silly government. <laughs> um, so yeah, I have heard from, so I was out on farms, so I have uh, a relationship with some of them. Um, since we've met, I've had two reach out for information on dental. Um, I have a worker that chipped a tooth, where do I go, what do I do? Um, I've had seven reach out for uh, mobile COVID testing, um, which makes sense given what I did in the summers. Um, and I had one reach out for primary care, um, but they didn't realize he had already gone to a walk-in clinic in Windsor. Um, already. So um, I haven't seen any big asks. Uh, flu shots were um, offered and most all, all farms said, yeah, uh, we put it out and um, workers weren't interested. So that was on my end that um, education materials to socialize flu shots wasn't well done. Um, but unfortunately, I wear like seven different hats. So couldn't sit and do the research to find the words, to make the posters, to try it again. Um, and the health unit uh, didn't have any. I will say Chatham um, delivered flu shots well, but they go on farm. Um, they're two big growers in Chatham and they have is, is existing relationships. So it's easy when your nurse practitioner who you see for your toes already says, hey, while you're here, do you want a flu shot? Sure I do, because I know her and um, so yeah, that's where primary care is at for that. Um, what else did you want me to talk about, Summer? That's awesome. Uh, I'll just open it for suggestions and other thoughts from the group now that we're coming back together. I think at an earlier point, we talked about co-designing a survey together because we talked about, you know, Harrow um, had reached out to area growers to see how might we serve you better. Um, Justine had talked about a survey that did go out to growers to say what type of healthcare needs are you seeing? So could we then do this together? Um, but I think just understandably, we kind of paused that for the reasons that that Laura mentioned is that we want to make sure that if we're reaching out to the growers to say, hey, we have this task group, we want to work together, we want to co design it, we don't want to do it to you, then we may create an expectation that we at this point in time can't quite meet. Um, but but perhaps there are some other creative solutions that we could talk through um, with this group. I have a question. So Laura, what I'm getting is the challenge is that there just aren't, isn't the staff resources needed to follow through with a lot of these? Mm -hmm. um, that's correct. So, um, like a family health team, for example, Margot's group, um, they each have a, not a set number, but you know, a target number of rostered patients. And then people beg them to add you know, 200 more on to each one. They have, um, not, I don't, I'm not speaking to Margot's team directly, but most have waiting lists for new patients, some of whom have been waiting a long time. Um, as somebody that relocated to Chatham, uh, there hasn't been primary care accepting new patients in two years. So there are people that have legitimately been waiting. We're making a bit of a workaround if somebody is in the ER needing to be discharged and they're a temporary foreign worker. Um, we've got that piece worked out. Um, so that was just a long-winded example, but there are care needs for the entire community. Um, how do we balance meeting uh, temporary foreign worker needs and community needs and keeping everything rolling. Um, a CHC is um, a good approach to that, um, but they have um, all vulnerable populations. So we get part of their time. I would love to just have full-time staff that I could say, okay, you're going to Muchi today and you're going here. Um, they just have competing roles across there too. So um, there's a willingness and an interest. Uh, capacity is a challenge. Leamington Family Health Team is uh, 
given the go-ahead to try and hire 25 uh, new practitioners if they are successful, which sounds amazing, but it's like one person at a time and recruitment is a challenge. If they are successful, there is a willingness to carve off a chunk of their rostered patient time and see, try a pilot there. But, you know, we have to find the people, they have to be willing to go on farms, they have to be the right candidate um, as well. So um, I don't really have uh, immediate solutions other than, I know Rita had posted and was interviewing last week, if that comes to fruition, um, I will hopefully have somebody out on farms as soon as that person is trained. But and again, just a tiny subset of... Because so. I'm new, was this a, this a problem that has always been and now is exacerbated by COVID? Uh, like staffing? I, if, uh, if I might. Oh, well, Justine, you first. <laughs> Um, well, I think, yes, it's a problem that's always been, and I guess we're, we're just more acutely aware of how many barriers there are to accessing healthcare for migrant workers or temporary foreign workers. And so, I mean, Sarah May has been working on this for a long time and certainly identified those barriers in the past. Uh, just nobody was very interested, <laughs> to be frankly blunt. And now that the spotlight has been shone on this population, there's a lot more interest and hence funds to be able to kind of fix some of those problems. So there's always been, they've always had access, access is not the word. Um, they, healthcare has always been there for them, <laughs> but the issue of access has always been a major problem uh, for all those kind of intangible reasons rather than they don't have OHIP, which they do have OHIP and, and some health coverage as well. So, Like, like a nurse practitioner shortage, that's not new. Okay. Right. Can I step in from a primary care perspective? Mm -hmm. So my question about um, finding a person, is it because you're trying to second it a person from a different agency? Is that the barrier or are you trying to hire someone at the LIN to fit, to provide services for this population? Because it's different. Mm -hmm. um, no, like our, I haven't, well, I, but we haven't been given a pool of funding. I've been asked to find capacity within existing care so the ask would be uh, to have somebody from your team agree to go out and be on a farm four hours every other week or something. Um, there's no funds attached to it. It's trying to find capacity within existing uh, providers. Okay, because that is fundamentally the problem because there is no shortage. Like, sorry, I shouldn't say that. There's no shortage. For it, when, when we have an application for a nurse practitioner position, we get multiple applications. And I know that there aren't enough positions in Windsor-Essex to, um, to be filled by all these new grads. And so there really, there should be no issue of retaining a nurse practitioner. Um, the, the, the million dollar question is who's willing to give up their resource. Um, and then that person is now not able to come back to your family health team or to your CHC because now they're working in a different sector. So there's a lot of different things that we need to really think about when we're um, second, uh, when we have staff on secondment is that you need to really think about, okay, do we want these people back in our facility with, without having an isolation period? Do we want to start thinking about, you know, um, sharing staff that's fine for a period but a lot of us are trying to to run an organization with a, with basic numbers of staffing already um there's that rumor that you know primary care disappeared during covid we didn't disappear we were we were running full time full speed ahead and trying to do everything that we possibly could um, with the number of staff that we have. And if anyone was getting sick, you're like, okay, work from home. Like you have to be ready to react very quickly and you need those extra people. Should someone become ill? Should someone get a common cold? Should somebody's child get a common cold? You need the staff. So it's really hard to say, yes, we have um, this one nurse practitioner um, 
for us, or, and for a lot of teams, it would mean closing um, you know, our satellite site, or it would mean not being able to offer a PAP clinic or a, or a flu clinic or something like that that we, what we're currently providing within um, our, uh, our services today. So I think that there would be a better uptake if there was actually um, the allocated funding or the reallocation of a provider that's already LIN funded um, to do that to do that service. We have a clinical care coordinator embedded with our team. And so I went to her and said, you know, vulnerable patients is a, uh, vulnerable patients and high risk patients include migrant workers. I have a new sector for you to take care of. And she's like, yep, it's a criteria. And it's not quite health links, but we technically don't have health links anymore. It's coordinated care planning. So we were creative and so if, someone needs that service, then we're able to kind of find a way. Um, maybe we need to reinvent what certain people are doing, or maybe we need to think about, you know, what the full scope of practice is for everybody's employees um, and not just reaching out to primary care that's already being asked to do so much. Um, maybe not everybody, but a lot of people are. So, I don't know. I, I think you're put into you're you're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place because you're being given a mandate to thou shalt find people um, when their home base is saying we need these people. So it's either going to have to be an iron fist from our funder saying stop primary care. We need people redirected here. Um, or people are, or teams are just going to say our community needs us and we're going to provide care to our community because that's what our mandate is. So we need direction. Um, and if you give direction, if the, if our funder gives us direction, then we will do it. But remember family health teams are not funded by the LIN directly. They're funded by the ministry of health and the primary care branch. So that causes an extra layer, an extra barrier for the LIN. Um, but the CHC should be man. Sorry for CH. Uh, there's no CHC representation here, but CHCs are meant to take care of vulnerable patients, and they should be supported to do that work. Um, and that's my opinion. So if that's giving them an extra NP so that they can manage the NP so they can go to the farms, then that's what should be happening. So I'll step off my soapbox. And how do, how do the additional resources that the Leamington Health team were whatever allowed to have or whatever that, that, you know, like I've heard they've been given permission to hire people. I don't know if that comes with any money, which is obviously no good if it doesn't, <laughs> but like where so, does that fit into this? So the family health team in Leamington is a, a family health organization joined with the family health team. So the family health organization is the group of physicians. And so that FO, like if you hear FO, fit, big. Yeah. So the FO is um, the group of physicians that put an application with the support of the LIN to acquire more physicians for the community. And they were granted this magic number of 23, I think it is. Yeah. And so, and I believe that it's only a certain amount. I don't even know if it's that high, but anyway, there's a big number of physicians for that foe. So it just means that they've opened up the foe and they can allow that many more physicians to come in to work with them. The family health team does not fund that part of it. The family health team gets rent from the foe. Right. So they, they pay the family health team rent in order to use those mm -hmm. services. It strikes me, yeah, like, I mean, it strikes me as a, you know, and I, I don't know how the, the healthcare ministries work or the LIN in terms of funding, but I know that quite often in the ag ministries, you have to essentially, there, there's such an emphasis on demonstrating need that you basically have to get halfway down the road to, to hiring someone to demonstrate there is need before they'll actually give you money to fill that need. So, mm -hmm. you know, it strikes me unless we can actually get a nurse and, and maybe someone made in the, the chat here a suggestion that maybe that's paid by uh, the growers, which I don't think would be that much of an issue. You know, if we can get a nurse and show that they're like booked out for however many weeks, 
then is, is that the kind of proof that the land or the ministry is looking for in terms of saying, okay, now we'll fund this? Because to me, I mean, I guess to your original question, Monica, you were asking, has this always been a problem? No one's ever had this population in their plan for providing health care. Like, I think that's fundamentally the problem. This has never been planned for, so hence there's no resources per se. And now people are like, oh, yeah, I guess we need to have more resources for this population. So that's kind of the... And that was right my my question was is the lack of resources people to staff it which I'm hearing no that there's there are people who will take a if there's a new job there are graduates and people who will fill it it's about so money. that's not that it's about money mm -hmm. yeah okay it's it's just justifying the money <laughs> hi it's Liz I was gonna make a comment because um if it comes to money, I know that farms, some farms probably may pay for it if you hired a nurse practitioner just for that. Um, but when, you, when you're working for, for a team, too, they, they bill to OHIP because they all have OHIP, so they could bill to OHIP for their visits. Where well, the difference is if it's a community um, like health team, like the Immigrant Health, we have one nurse practitioner there, they can't bill. They can't bill separately to OHIP because they're being, they're, their salary is coming out of the pot that um, is provided by the Lynn for the whole clinic and everybody in the clinic, right? So there's a difference if you hired somebody, mm -hmm. they, like they still can bill their time to OHIP, right? Hmm. Yeah, this has been a tough one. So, you know, again, it's it's not new in that sense where we, we don't have designated people to serve this population. Um, but do we you know, can you pilot something? Can you show the need and then therefore, you know, make yeah. the case for it to continue to get funded? The risk with that is having it and then not having it is is a disaster, I think, in any case. But we had seen it before where the CHC had a nurse practitioner, a Spanish-speaking nurse practitioner who was placed kind of strategically. Um, and when she moved away, she left a, a, a caseload of 200 people with no follow-up. Um, and so that's, it's kind of risky. Um, but at the same time, you know, can we talk about those kind of creative solutions that build the case? The light's certainly shining on it now. And so mm -hmm. I feel like in some odd ways, we're almost in a better place now than we were before COVID trying to do this planning work where we knew it was important. We knew we had to get ahead of it. We're looking at the numbers. We're saying, you know, like if, if there are eight to 10,000 migrant workers here, that's, that's great when they're all healthy. Um, and don't need care, but what happens when they're not? And I think there were some comments made through the community conversations that Justine was leading around, you know, um, they take care of us with our food supply, but we're not really mm -hmm. taking care of them in the needs while they're here. And if they're here for like two years, then, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that suggests that it's not terribly temporary. Like if they're going yeah. back home for vacation and then coming back here, then that is our community. It just yeah. so happens that many of our community members don't see them as community members. And so that's what's changed, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to, I don't know how the billing of the NPs bill if they have their own clinic. I, I've never looked into that, but NPs earn around $120,000 a year. And so you would have to find, you would have to be competitive to um, hire an NP have to provide those benefits and those premiums and all those things. So it almost would be better to find a physician who can build to OHIP and can do that work um, like what they do at retirement homes and then maybe put that ask to the OMA and to negotiate with the uh, Ministry of Health to provide a premium for, in, for treating um, vulnerable, po vulnerable populations like the migrant worker population. I think we'd get a lot of leverage from that, especially what, during a negotiation year. It's not a huge ask and it's such a vulnerable population. There's a lot of attention to it. Um, just an idea, um, because to, to ask for that one position it might be really difficult because it is such an expensive position and you, you want to show um, numbers behind it. And if you're seeing, I don't want to sound disrespectful, but if you're seeing just like five people a day, it becomes like a really expensive um, position mm -hmm. to have. Um, and it would have to be really well utilized. And so I only bring that up because it's a common conversation 
with my team is like, okay, that's a really expensive um, position. So how are we going to best utilize, you know, these people? So another thought uh, from a primary care perspective, it's not impossible. It's just, it's hard to, to see that you have to find the, the numbers so that there's like that value behind it. So one of the creative solutions that, you know, we haven't really explored an awful lot, and maybe it's timely that we have Eduardo on the call now as well, not to put you on the spot, but I'm sure you're well connected across the province, is now that virtual care is an option, I don't know how well loved it is in the sector, but I do know that the walk-in clinic that was available pre-COVID near the library, and I say it that way because that's how the workers knew it, um, it was all virtual with a physician, I believe, based out of Toronto. So not perfect, not ideal, didn't bring continuity of care. Um, I don't, I think some workers were paying for it out of pocket, not understanding their OHIP. Anyways, totally imperfect. But um, is there an opportunity now to start thinking about virtual care solutions where the physician may not necessarily be here? Just going to put it out there. Yeah, and I was going to comment too, I'm, I'm a little bit less familiar with the region. I, I have a couple colleagues that are a bit more, but I do, and I, and I know there was talk about the difference between the CHCs, but we did, we have experience working with Quest CHC in Niagara and Grand River CHC that both received, to my understanding, specialized funding for their team for a very focused on migrant farm worker or primary health care. Um, so I'm not sure if folks have had, con you know, connections with them way, way back when, when they had to, so similarly, Grand River was the first one, when they had to kind of prove the needs, we actually helped them and they, they um, wrote out a report um, that was a combination of different uh, agencies that were working in support of workers to kind of, again, paint the needs part of it. And we then provided them our clinical data to say, every time we've, you know, done, run a parachute clinic, we see this amount, but there's always you know, we always turn away, right? Um, and so that kind of worked for them. And I know that every year from when they started getting the specialized funding Grand River, they blew their numbers like out of the water. Like the, the requirement of numbers that they, that was tied to the money they were getting, they were like double, like it was the neat, you know, once they got rolling. But again, this was pre-COVID and they had a, you know, they rented a service location right downtown of, of Norfolk and Simcoe. Um, so it was, you know, they just got a great location, but there was so much need of, of workers that, that weren't accessing healthcare before. So maybe I'm, maybe you, you all know this and, and had already connected them, but, but I know that we had even that report that was that first kind of needs report, we had passed that around to different communities as an example of, of what Grand River or CHC had done. Um, and yeah, recently they were, their mobile clinic was featured on CBC radio on um, uh, black uh, white coat, black art. And uh, it was kind of a, a webcast around their, their physician and, and nurse arriving on a farm and, and running a farm um, and it got a lot of attention, but I think that's, that's something maybe to, to worth uh, exploring. And then also in terms of the virtual care, we, we have worked through our clinics. We had um, identified physicians based in, in both Kitchener Waterloo area. There seems to be kind of some floating physicians that were interested in working with these populations that we've pulled in. And then eventually they went to Grand River as well. And uh, there was a couple based in Toronto too, that just have an interest in this population. So that could be something else to explore to see what they're up to and and things like that as well um but yeah i can i can definitely unpack any of that if any of that is is interesting or that yeah. sounds great thanks Eduardo. we actually have quest in grand river nv uh here <laughs> and we've been having a lot of conversations with our windsor essex chc um looking at how we might replicate something like that the way that that was created was done at a time period where with a very small amount of sort of seed funding they called it they were able to expand in that way um so with things being the way that they are now it's a little bit of a different ask and i know they're having those conversations with the alliance with the aohc mm -hmm. i don't know what it's called now margo alliance for healthy communities um conversations directly with ontario health um, and Ontario Health West to try to see like, is there an opportunity to invest? Can we do something in a bigger way? Because if we could, we'd love to put one right where the fresh co is. Um, but in the meantime, I think what Laura and I were tasked to do was, you know, cobble together whatever we can find. And this is what we've come up with. Not a whole lot, but certainly like Laura said, a willingness, um, an opportunity to co-design something. So in that way, it's like moving forward. <laughs> um, we just don't have an awful lot in our hands right now. So, so with ourselves being in the red zone again um, and talking about virtual solutions as a 
gap filler, perhaps that second option that you talked about is something we could explore just in the meantime, but not stop there. Because I know there's conversations happening at a higher level. Um, they've talked about perhaps, you know, starting the mobile unit back up again when it's safe to do so. Um, but yeah, like what are we doing in the meantime? What are we offering to people right now um, when they need it? Mm -hmm. And and I guess I have to definitely, but I know that we also had a budget early on. So we actually, as part of Grand River's uh, program, we actually covered a certain amount of physician hours for a physician that was actually an add-on to their team. So we're not a large organization, but we had a big chunk of funding when we were running our parachute clinics that then kind of didn't go anywhere. And we still, and so I like, again, obviously it's not a potentially long-term solution and we get funding through labor, not health, but it could be interesting to see if there's opportunity to maybe explore with additional funding, because I think we used to, yeah, we used to cover hours of physician that was working specifically with migrant workers, because it falls under our, our mandate to have that kind of occupational lens. And, and a lot of the, and it doesn't have to necessarily, I mean, be occupational, right? It was, it was open, but I can, I'll go back and kind of explore a lot of this to see if anything comes out. Super. And then Justine, I wonder, um, you know, while you're there, um, how, how could we talk with growers like I just think it's really sensitive right and I'm I'm I hesitate to say what I'm even going to say is like if if there are growers that were willing to uh, cover the cost as was suggested here by Stephanie um, it's delicate because the onus is also on the healthcare system to respond to those that have OHIP so I just I, I'm mindful that it seems a little um, inequitable um, unjust even that the growers should have to put in the funding. However, with what we were talking about here, it's not for lack of people that could go out. It's just, how do we, how do we carve out the actual capacity? So I'm just wondering if that's even something we could approach. Uh, I mean, we can approach it. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know if, if growers are necessarily going to think it through that far. You know, most of them that have, have hired nurses for COVID reasons have just done it out of pocket. Of course, you know, that's obviously daily uh, health checks is not something that's covered by OHIP. So that, that's a very clear uh, boundary, but it, so I don't think it would be something that would be off putting to them. I don't think that they would immediately jump to the conclusion, why should I pay from this when, when OHIP, OHIP should be covering it. Um, but on, on kind of an equity <laughs> perspective, you're right. Why, you know, why should somebody, anybody, have to pay for this out of pocket when it should be covered by OHIP. I don't know. I don't know how we navigate that conversation. I mean, is there any way we can get it covered by OHIP? That would require a doctor to essentially sign off on those services. Is that how it works? Yeah, that's kind of what we're looking for. I think that I don't think we ever thought we would find one model that's going to work because we don't have a Grand River or a Quest type of a setup here. Mm -hmm. So I think what we're doing is, can we do a little bit of this here and a little bit of that there? Um, and so I think we're still in that exploratory stage of, you know, what can we, and we're going to find a solution. I feel like the next time we come together, we're going to have like three things. Mm -hmm. So like, I wonder if, oh. um, I don't know if this makes any sense. Like, but I wonder if it's like some, cause essentially if, if uh, okay, so let's just say CHC CHC agreed to manage an NP, but couldn't afford it because it's not in their budget. You know, if if the growers then paid for that NP, that NP could then bill OHIP for services. Is that correct? Am I correct on this? No. No, okay. the NP would be a salaried employee. So like Margo was saying, the NP, if we ballpark it at 120000 mm -hmm. salary, um, that would be the cost there. And I think mm -hmm. um, the other piece would be OHIP billing by physician per yeah. encounter is something that the growers wouldn't have to take care of. Right. Okay. So maybe the physician billing on the behalf of services delivered by the NP. Am I, am I not following this right? Like just describe it to me in a normal, a normal context, right? A, a practice hires an NP, they pay them a salary. The work that the NP does, is that billed to OHIP somehow? That's a Margo. Yeah, I'm looking at her. I'm looking at her square. <laughs> uh, so I, I have heard, I have heard that there are NPs who have their own practice. Now that's not my realm. Okay. Sure. Even how that even works. I think they would have to have a physician consultant. Mm -hmm. uh, but in our world, 
we have, we hire an NP, they provide a service within their scope of practice and they, they have a, a certain scope. Um, they still have to consult with physicians from time to time, depending on what's under their umbrella. Um, but typically it's like, it's like me, I go, I come to work, I get paid salary. It's the same kind of thing. So they don't, our, our NPs do are under a special program where they are, their work is monitored um, under un, NPAR, but not all of them are. So that might be an exception. Um, so let's just say no, it's just, they have to do, they, they probably would have to bill something, um, but that's just for your own records. So you can track statistics, but other than that, it's just a salary plus your, your Mercs and your benefits that you offer. I'm just curious about um, volunteer opportunities. Is there any way that that might fill in temporarily? I mean, there's um, Doctors Without Borders, um, Health Force Ontario that I believe had some volunteer opportunities for med medical professionals. I don't know. I'm just, it's just something that came to mind. Is that something that's even an option or do you think? Um, I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, I would probably, you know, keep this as a takeaway. Um, and I know that Eduardo was going to look into the possibility of some, I think you referred to them as floating physicians. Yeah. Gave me an interesting visual. So that's why I remembered it that way. But perhaps there are some physicians out there, as you suggest, that are, you know, out there somewhere with an interest and a willingness to help out here. So, but that would likely be kind of our virtual care solution. So if that's of interest, and I think that, you know, it just depends on the comfort level of the grower and the worker um, to do it that way. But again, if we're, if we're heading towards another lockdown, um, that's kind of the only way. And I think that's what a lot of the primary care providers have been doing this whole time, which is maybe what started that whole rumor, Margot, that primary care isn't there, it's there. It just is trying to find a new way to do all of these things, you know. And then with, to that point, the roadshow that Laura and I are also on with the We Speak rollout, so that's also inclusive of video interpretation. So for any of those nurse practitioners or physicians or you know, primary care providers that would like to assist but don't have the language on board, you know, there is a digital solution for that already that we do have. So Harrow will still take on everybody who in Harrow. So if we already have the capacity, I know that there's 15 firms. So we can definitely do that. We haven't had great uptake, but we'll try again in the spring. So if that's a takeaway, you got that. They can come to us. They can be seen by primary care. We'll figure it out virtually or in person. And we have a bunch of different services that we have like foot care and we have, um, I'm starting conversations for dental and vision so that we're prepared for the spring. So there's there's already that those pieces happening, and then also transportation. We've been um, I've been constant I'm in constant communication with Tracy Bailey about different projects and foot care and transportation is definitely on board with um, with Tracy. And another just um, another idea is the Schulich School of um, Medicine. They are trying to, so there's a bunch of things that are happening behind the scenes and a lot of the docs, um, they're done their residency, but they can't get their license. So they have this, um, this gap and they have to have a preceptor. So I wonder if there is an opportunity to find a doc that would be the, the lead, I guess. And I'm sure that you could find a champion somewhere and these, these other physicians that are just waiting to get their you know, their, their ticket or their real, their full license, mm -hmm. if they could get their experience by spending their time um, at different greenhouses. I mean, it might be something that is worthwhile and maybe Dr. Zeter might be interested in, in having that conversation with, with the group. So, and you don't know what languages they speak and where they're from. And, you know, so it, it, I think that there's going to be two cohorts that are on a delay. So just another thought. Yeah. Could that also be a recruitment strategy for Leamington? Sure could. So if they were their preceptor, mm -hmm. do they have a, a, a you know, physicians that could be a preceptor who then, you know, they can work under them and at the same time nurture that, that relationship with them in, in hopes to recruit them into their practice? 
For sure. I do know that Leamington does accept residents regularly and that um, they're linked with the medical school already. Uh, Harold's just starting to do that work, so we don't have those strong ties, but Leamington would. They've been doing that for a while now. It's a good strategy. So are those conversations you're already having with Leamington, Margo, or something that we can take away to support, like just as a next steps? I think maybe if you guys present it, it might come from a different level of authority than, hey, Margo has another idea. Yeah. I have lots of ideas. <laughs> this is a whole group of people like that, by the way. <laughs> and I'm just, have, I'm, yeah, go ahead. I have one. Before we end, I just have an off-topic one. Okay. Um, I just wanted to double check, you know, just because I, I just recognized that we we're almost at 2.30, but um, I wanted to ask about um, the yeah. workplace wellness um, CMHA um, connections to growers and if there's any updates there, because I get that, that you know, it's not necessarily primary care, but that's kind of like that wellness prevention. How are we, you know, building that relationship with the workers directly so that that way, once we do get our system sorted out, we've already got some relationship, you know, building blocks. Just checking in on how that's going or not going and mm -hmm. if there's anything we can do to help. Allison, do you want to give an update? Hi. Uh, yeah, sure. So currently, uh, things have been pretty stagnant on um, that side of things. Um, my perception without having been told this directly is that I think the farms are a little bit overwhelmed right now with um, wait, the, our second wave of COVID and aren't really super focused on the mental health initiatives at this time and also getting me on farm um, when there's you know concerns about outbreaks and, and different things. Um, I haven't had a, a strong response now. That being said, we also haven't done any um, big initiatives of reaching out to the farms. Um, just because we're not really sure what all of that looks like right now. The, the one farm I was in contact with has kind of gone uh, silent on me right now. I've checked in a couple of times, but there hasn't been a whole lot of progress on that front. Um, so it hasn't moved much from there. I yeah. have a little bit better luck in January-ish because uh, we're kind of heading into clean out season now, which is extremely hectic time. People are trying to get the greenhouse cleaned out and the seedlings planted and set for the year. So that's a, usually a very busy time. Uh, so I, I would say maybe January, second week of January, you might get a little bit more uptake. Okay. Yeah, that, that was kind of my thought as well. Yeah, and I mean, like we're, we're ready and anxious to, to do whatever we can. It's just this it goes from like, you know, we're in yellow and now we're red and then we're, he we're heading for lock. You know, it's just, I get it. They're focused on a lot of different things, just trying to keep afloat. So we're ready when, uh, when, when they're ready. Allison, are you able to provide this for other uh, businesses, organizations? Or are you, is your funding specifically around ag? No, the funding is not around ag at all. <laughs> um, I'm primarily in other workforces. I'm not really in the agricultural sector yet. Um, right now I'm working with um, retirement homes, um, some manufacturing, some insurance companies, a youth center. Um, I'm, I'm in a, a couple spaces that way. Okay. Um, originally you were gonna send me a, a bit of a promotional piece around it but I don't think I ever got that. That or my inbox is just always about to combust. So <laughs> if you wouldn't mind resending something to me, um, I have a couple of workplaces that I know I, I work closely with, including our own, okay. uh, would really gain from this. So um, would love to, to get, it, get you in our schedule. Yeah, that'd be wonderful. Uh, I'll, I'll send something over or, or, or Kim or myself will, yeah. will connect you with some promotional material yeah. materials. Great. Um, same here. I can send it around to Ontario Health. And in turn, if you want to try another farm or two, yeah. a yeah. smaller yeah. one, a bigger one, like whatever, I am happy to help connect uh, piecemeal as well. I wonder if Stephanie, who unfortunately had to leave, um, she's representing a farm here. She's very keen on being supportive, so maybe there's an opportunity there as well. Yeah, I'll follow up with her. Okay. 
Yeah, you tend to, um, you could also send something to me. I could try and rally some some friendly farms uh, <laughs> to jump in. Because <laughs> um, I think I think the way things spread most in our sector is word of mouth. Yeah. So, you know, if Stephanie does it on her farm and then says something to her buddy and then that buddy says something to his buddy, yeah. that tends to be the way things spread. So. Yeah, yeah. Where I will send it around. Perfect. Can I share my off topic idea before we finish up? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I was just thinking about um, Eduardo's tool employer toolkits and the idea of the Duotang that you can't do right now because we can't all share Duotang and then Laura's sheltering and isolation. Um, I know if, if there were resources, would some kind of a publication in the comic photonovela pictogram that maybe you had, I mean, it's a one time putting together a comp publication with resources for ag workers that you could have, each person could have their own in their quarantine room or in their isolation room. Is yeah, that something that even seems like a good idea? I would say that's all in the works. Oh, okay. Never yeah. mind. <laughs> yeah, I think with this project with, with Justine that, that uh, with Omafra, I think that's kind of what we're aiming for is this both for employers to kind of resources that they can use. And, but yeah, I think that would make sense in terms of, I wrote down when it was, it makes sense, you know, within that time that workers are kind of before they're working, right, uh, would be an ideal moment. And then um, ensuring then the, the, the employer then kind of connects that to practices of, of that particular workplace would be ideal. But yeah, I think we're gonna, that's our aim to, to have something like that, yeah. Like the magazine at the movie theater. Yeah. Like, I'm here for 10 minutes. Or a video, yeah. you know, or something, yeah. But this was kind of the vision of uh, or the vision of one of Omafra's control and prevention strategy items since the summer, and I've been essentially bugging them for months as to what their involvement is going to be in this. And eventually, Eduardo and I decided to just go off on our own and just do it and have the sector pay for it. And it was like almost immediately, Omafra turned around and was like, "We have a bunch of money we want to give you, uh, but it has to be done by January." <laughs> so it was like, yeah. Awesome. So <laughs> there is the money for doing things. We are doing things. Uh, how quickly they will happen is question mark, but uh, things things will happen and we'll be ready at some point within the next three to four months, let's say. <laughs> yeah. Hey, do we need to talk about next meeting? Are we going to meet next year? Yeah. <laughs> Will we all be here next year? Hoping. Yeah, I might not be. I think, I think that's not a secret now. <laughs> yeah, so for anybody who doesn't know on this call, I am moving on to a new position as of January. Oh no. So, <laughs> so I, I won't be working for OGBG, but as I've mentioned several times, I am very committed to, um, to a good transfer of activities, especially on this project. My work with temporary foreign workers is certainly a bit of a passion of mine. So happy to be involved for as long as it takes to get a replacement up to speed, uh, even if that goes beyond January. So, so there's no replacement for you yet. I think the window closes on the 11th. We have a job ad posted. So with hopes we might get somebody in before I'm gone. Um, but we'll with the term replacement, in the region, so. re replacement used loosely because I don't <laughs> think so. And I, how did you know, Justine, that I was looking at your square <laughs> when I said. Well, nobody else was saying anything. So. I didn't want to out you, but I thought, holy cow, how are we going to continue this work without the one who yeah. struck it and kind of, you know, <laughs> yeah. pulled it together into being. So um, I'm going to feel that loss. Mm -hmm. All of us will definitely. Yeah. Gotta find a way to come back in to the yeah. circle. Yeah. Like I said, I'm I'm happy to be involved. You know, once I gonna get my feet under me at my new role, I think uh, I think there'll be an opportunity for me to contribute still to this group. Not in terms of that that role, but uh, yeah. where are you um, moving yeah. to? I'm not moving. I'm staying in oh. the area, um, okay. but I'm I'm going to a position with a company called Crop Life Canada. So they represent all the life science and agrochemical suppliers to the sector. So 
kind of your, your fertilizers, uh, biocontrol, seeds, all the inputs for farming, basically. Well, there's, I'm sure there's lots of ways to connect you to this work. Yeah. Absolutely. We'll invent ways if we have to. Yeah. yeah. Eduardo, very creative. we're going to come up with another yeah. project for you to work on with Justine. Yeah. yeah. That's, um, pesticide safety, I could sell that pretty easy. <laughs> And it'll come into the hub. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> awesome. So how do we want to look for a next meeting? Do we do we just pick one or like I know that's the most effective, but we're over time. So I just I'm asking if if it's doodle or just pick one. What's everybody feeling? Everybody put your hand up and say, I swear <laughs> by the end of tomorrow I will answer the doodle. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let's do it that way. All right. Well, what week are we looking is there a specific week we're looking to in the new year can, can we try like a i would suggest mid to late january i'm not sure but people need okay. time to yeah. have updates to share and yeah. there's going to be a whole you know slow down period so my vote would be towards the end of the month okay yeah i agree yeah yeah i'm, I'm gonna send that out today the yeah first two weeks of january so i'm off nice no, I'm off at assessment centers. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> nice. Okay, nice. I guess it's right. nice for nice of you. It's nice of you to do that. A week Laura. three or week four would be best. Okay, can we aim for week four? Yep. Even first week of February at the very worst, um, which would make it exactly one year since we had our last migrant worker health meeting before we ended up with a task force. Oh, wow. Yep. That would be interesting. I'll dust off those meeting notes. <laughs> all right. Okay. Well, Thank you all. Take care. Well, Hi, happy everybody. holidays, everyone. Bye, happy everybody. Happy Bye. 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 We'll be talking. Bye. Merry Bye. Christmas. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs>